Okay. We are recording now. White crayon works on black paper though. All right, fine. I'll just buy black paper then. <laughs> All right. Excellent way to start a lecture. That's what got recorded first. All right. Where are we? We are talking about lecture seven material. Before we do that, we are going to talk about something that's coming up next week. What is that? Exam one is coming up. Did you guys look at the section created on Piazza? Get a little bit intimidated. It's just one exam, right? Like you guys keep saying, I want back exams, back exams. I gave you all, that, all the ones that I had. Now, if there are 15 at the end, <laughs> that doesn't mean that, yeah. Oh my God, Do, why did you guys have to say that? All right. Yeah, so. But... Yes, it has been 20 years. I had it, so I shared it. All right. So take a look at that. Uh, Obviously, some things are going to be different. If you see some Laplace transforms being present on those exams, you know you can ignore that. You don't have Laplace transforms. We are going to be uh, stopping at lecture seven, right? So wherever we stop with lecture seven, that's going to be content on exam one. I will be posting some other resources as well, topics that are going to go. Format of the exam will be discussed in exam review session. Um, before we get to that, I have to assess who is going to take the exam when. So I'll have two time slots. One is going to be during class time. One is going to be later on in the day. So I'll ask you guys to sign up for it. So there will be a assessment on grade scope, like a multiple choice assessment. Which time slot do you want to sign up for? There are two time slots, time slot one, time slot two. Sign up for one of them. You get one point for signing up for time slot one, then you get two points for signing up to time slot two so that you can go back. If you sign up for time slot one, you can go back and look at your score and you know you were in one. One is going to be the usual time. Two is going to be say eight to 10 p.m. So two hours end to end. Our exams in person are on WebEx. They are all going to be on WebEx. They are going to be proctored. I'm talking about microphones, cameras on all the time. No headphones, no earphones. Clickety-clack on keyboards are going to be um, discouraged. I don't want you guys to be typing too much. Scrolling up and down, the exam paper is fine, but I don't want you guys to be typing things. Um, nothing in your ears, right? No headphones. Put your cell phone away. Have the camera on. Have your microphone on. So I'll cover all of these things. This is how I conducted exams for signals uh, even last year. It went really well. Uh, nobody had to worry about proctors because I was the proctor and I heard everything that happened in the background from moms yelling to dogs barking to I've heard it all. I will ignore it, not judge it. Uh, my goal is for you guys to take the exam in a, uh, can we write on our iPads? Please don't write on iPads. Write it on a piece of paper. So here for signals is going to be a very unfair advantage for you, uh, for people who have iPads. Straight lines, diagrams are gonna appear and come out really well on iPads, which is the reason why I have to um, uh, uh, discourage that. Use pieces of paper and scan it. I have, I'm assigning 20 minutes for scanning and uploading time. And if you guys have used the uh, tools of scanning and uploading directly from your iPhone or whatever, phone. Have any, has anybody done that? Directly scan things in as pictures into Gradescope? No? You guys are missing out on a big time saver. Here, when, if you log in to an exam using your cell phone, right? Your cell phone has a web browser, say Chrome. You log in to Gradescope using Chrome. You start the exam over there, right? You don't need to start the exam again, so here, you, start, you can start your exam on the laptop, look at all the paper, look at all the questions, answer them. You still have the two hours, right? So within that time, if you log in using your cell phone, it is going to be within that time. So you can do that. And then once you do that, you will see a link 
please select the files to upload for question one, right? You click on that link on your cell phone, it'll allow you to access the camera on your cell phone, take pictures, and done. So that will get it done in two minutes instead of Google Drive and da, 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 da. Did it not allow you from the beginning, or did it allow you and then stop? Okay. Let's do it this way. I will create a false exam, fake exam. Practice on that. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then you have to try to figure out alternatives. Colin. A one hour, 40 minute exam with 20 minute scanning. When I say 20 minute scanning, usually people test that boundary. Uh, <laughs> when I was proctoring the last year, like there were students who were sitting there in 10 minutes left, they are still writing. And I'm going, get up now. <laughs> so that has happened. Um, but then those students, you know, know a better process. They have a thing down. They feed it into a scanner and it sends them an email, they upload. So, no need to panic for that. All right, other question, go ahead. Uh, so it's gonna be open book. You can have whatever book you want in front of you. It's all, uh, I can't uh, control that. So I'm not gonna put a limitation on that. Open book, open notes. Uh, what else I was gonna, right. So for the things that you are gonna need for the exam though, that'll be provided in the exam. Uh, by me. So if we, that, you don't have to look at other places. Like trick identities, I'll give you guys that. Uh, was that? Right, summations, I'll give you guys that. Um, differentiation product rule, I'll give you guys that. So whatever you guys need while you're solving the problems, I'll give you guys that. Other questions? We'll do a review. Yeah? When should we do the review? All right, before the exam. So before the exam, we have one week. So what would be a really good time? Saturday or Wednesday? Like we are talking about an hour. Two exams this week? Yeah, this is everything. It will be recorded. You don't have to. Yeah, it'll. You guys are here. When you say recorded, oh yeah, there's going to be record. I can't record things when there's nobody on the other side. <laughs> I need somebody to talk to. That I can record. Oh, Saturday works better. Saturday works better. Saturday works better. All right, Saturday works better. All right. So I'll try to. Uh, get it done on a Saturday. Um, if I can't get it done on a Saturday, then it will be recorded on Friday and I'll give you guys a link. Um, so one of those two things. We'll talk about logistics, we'll talk about topics, we'll talk about things that you should be careful about, things you should be, you know, some test taking strategies specifically for signals. This is good, 11 minutes occupied. We have taken 11 minutes as usual. Let's start. Uh, lecture seven, what are we talking about? We are going to continue talking about convolution. This time we are going to look at convolution with an impulse. Then we'll get into convolution properties. So these are like a screwdriver and you know a lot of other things in your toolbox meant to or help with convolution. Time reversal, commutative property, cascade and parallel connections, time shifts, symmetry properties, derivative property, distributive property, a lot of properties. Nothing, nothing too difficult though. Let's see, um, just to recap convolution, let us see how, how well you guys have understood this. I have two continuous time functions, u of t and g of t, right? This is a gate. u of t is my unit step, g of t is my gate function. I'm trying to do a continuous time convolution between them 
and I am going to try to write the answer or draw the answer or represent the answer in ramp functions or using unit steps, whatever. Can you guys do that without putting, directly going to the answer? Think about doing this without the integrations and the math behind it. Can you guys directly go to the answer? Let's try to do that. For that, I will need u of t. So u of t is going to be just this. That's u of t, right? Yeah? And this guy is 1. Next, what is g of t? Open the gate at 0, close the gate at 1. OK. So that would mean that I do something like this. And then this guy becomes a 1 there, 1 there, and then this is g of t, and then this is t, right? Now the first question that you need to ask is, which signal should I leave as is? Which signal should I flip and shift? So which one are you keeping fixed? G of t? U of t is fixed, is good, right? Because you see, this guy is, it's, it would be difficult to sort of, if you flip it, it would be something like this. And then you're trying to look at what would happen here, and then what would happen here. In this case, it would still be okay. It's not like a very bad choice, it, but it is going to be simpler if I do g of t, flip and shift. So if I flip this and shift it, what do I have? Let's do this in um, green, maybe orange. This one will become something like this, right? What would that be? And what would that be? This is what? g of t minus tau. If I flip it, what are the edges? 0 and negative 1. But I need to add t to it. So that would be what? t plus 0, and then t minus 1. You guys agree with that? So I flipped it. The edges of that pulse became 0 and negative 1, and I added t to it. So it became t minus 1, t minus tau. g of t minus tau is t minus 1 to t. It is going to be a height of 1. You guys agree with that? All of this was also unnecessary, by the way, but I'm, I'm, I'm still doing it. Now, what is happening? g of t minus tau is moving from left to right. And as it, as it is moving from left to right, we are going to keep multiplying the two signals and integrate over the overlap. Yeah? So how, what is going to happen here? Let us try to sketch the result. over here. And you guys, uh, please help me with this. This is what? This is, I'm trying to sketch for y of t, and this is t, right? Case 1, t is less than 0. When t is less than 0, do you have overlap? No. So when t is less than 0, your answer is 0. Yeah. Now, t, this point, increases to more than 0. Until it goes completely in, that is going to be for one second, one time unit, right? For one time unit, how is this going to change? What are you going to have over there? A ramp, right? So it's going to linearly increase. Why? Rectangle, another rectangle is moving in. You will have that area because it's going to be 1 times 1, and then you integrate from 0 to t, right? So you're going to have a ramp. From when to when? 0 to what? So the, the end value is 1. That's what Zikao says. Everybody agrees with that? End value is 1. Why is that 1? u of t, 1. g of t minus tau, 1. Time for which you are integrating? 0 to 1. Why is that one second? Because this guy, when it goes completely inside this, it is going to be from 0 to 1, right? So 1 times 1 times 1, 1. So you've got this to be a 1. 
What happens after that? Lightens off, right? It's going to be staying at one, right? So it's going to stay at one. Yeah? And I need this as well, right? Oh, yeah. this is going to be one, this is going to be zero, and this is it. So zero for time less than zero. For one second after that, for one time unit after that, it is going to linearly increase. After that, it is going to stay the same. Now, did I need to do these things? I could have gone directly there, right? What will help? What will help is if you can sort of imagine these signals in your head. If you are having trouble with that, just put them on paper and you'll be able to track it. Bottom line is, we talked about analytical, analytical ways of solving continuous time convolution. We talked about graphical way, but there are going to be some things like this, which you should be able to go to without having to go through all the cases, right? Rectangle, rectangle gives you a triangle or a trapezoid should be like that. Yeah, should be like two times two. Yeah, we'll get there. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, we'll get there. Two times two is four. What did I say? Okay. <laughs> so my goal is for it to become that obvious, the convolution express, at least with, so here, a rectangle with rectangle, what is that? A constant here, a constant there, should become very simple. Any signal with impulse should be very simple. A linear function with a constant should be simple. What should become? complicated, maybe a little bit is linear increase with linear increase, a linear function with linear function. That's where things get, get a little bit more uh, complicated. But as long as you are in the constant and constant or impulse, things should be very, very quick. All right, let's talk about polynomial multiplication. Why are we talking about that? Because when we look at discrete convolution, we have an array algorithm. Right? You give me the numbers, I'll put it into an array form, multiply them, and then add on the diagonals to get the discrete convolution answer. You can view discrete convolution also as polynomial multiplication. So you have two polynomials over here. We are only looking at order two polynomial. X squared, some coefficient, X1 coefficient, constant is one co coefficient here, A0, A1, A2. And then similarly, you have another polynomial here, Q, B2 squared, B1X plus B0. When you multiply these out, what do you get? The highest power is going to be x to the 4. And let us suppose that those coefficients are c4, c3, c2, c1, and c0. Now, when you look at c2, what is c2? If you look at c2, the coefficient for x squared, it is going to be simply a2, b0, plus a1, b1, plus a0, b2, which you can write in the summation form as this. Summation k equals 0 to 2 a k b sub 2 minus k. a k, where have we seen that before? Summation, m goes from negative infinity to infinity, x of m, h of n minus m, very similar to this, right? So these coefficients are literally the convolution result. Well, so the one that we computed for n equals 2 was the convolution sum for n equals 2, the output at n equals 2. So discrete convolution is nothing but multiplying two polynomials and looking at the coefficients of your result. That is it. And you can validate that by using the array algorithm. So a little bit, you know, a, 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 another way of looking at discrete uh, convolution. That's all there is. What's going twice two in? Right. So you have got C4 as the coefficient over here of a to b2, that's your coefficient of x to the 4. So that's the non-zero element all the way to the left. And then you have c3, c2, c1, c0. Everything else is a zero. Convolution with an impulse. Oh, go ahead. Well, when you multiply the exponentials, you will be adding up the exponents. So that will not work for exponents. It will work for, because you want them to get multiplied. So it will work for polynomials, not with 
uh, polynomials with e to the x's will not work because they're there it'll sum. Next, convolution with an impulse. Again, this should be very, very simple for you guys. We are convolving a signal with an impulse. What should you get? Well, x of t convolved with delta of t. Let, if, if I wanted to write this convolution integral out, I would write this, negative infinity to infinity, x of tau, delta of t minus tau, d tau. I simply use the formula of convolution integral over here. So if this is OK, when is this impulse going to be valid? Only at one point. What is that? Time equals delta, right? So only when t equals delta, uh, t equals tau, only when t equals tau, that's, that's when it, this impulse is going to be valid. All the other times, it is invalid, right? You guys see that? So if t equals tau over here, x of tau at that time becomes what? x of t. And you are integrating from all time. So that delta, wherever that is, is going to be included in that. What do you get? You get x of t. This is simply your sampling property. You guys agree with all those statements? Impulse is going to be valid at only one time. What is that? Tau equals t, right? This argument needs to be zero. That's the only time it is valid, meaning you get a, uh, you know, impulse going up to infinity with a weight of one. Go ahead. Oh yeah. So x of t minus tau looks like. Well, first let me ask you this: What is the time axis you want it on? If you look at this, I'm differentiating with respect to tau, so I would want that to be with respect to tau. So if I plot this guy with tau, delta of t minus tau is going to be somewhere over here, and it is going to have uh, zero and tau, yeah, something like this. So for, for an impulse to be valid, right? For an impulse to be valid, this has to be zero. So only when t equals delta tau, this is going to have a weight of one. Everywhere else, it is going to have a weight of zero. So when you, mul when you multiply this guy with this, you are going to evaluate x of tau. So x of tau is something like this. You're going to multiply x of tau with this, right? So when you multiply, this is x of tau. When you multiply this guy with an impulse, what is going to happen? Well, all of this is going to go to 0. You're going to take this height, right? What is that height? x evaluated at x of t multiplied by an impulse, right? So what is that going to result? It is going to result in an impulse whose weight is x of t, and it is present at t with this as tau. Now when you integrate, because you are integrating from negative infinity to infinity, this is going to give you x of t, right? Because it's, you are integrating over that impulse. Better? All right, let me erase this so that no confusion is there. I didn't write it really nicely. OK, so let me erase this as well. All right, so that's your sampling property. In other words, a signal convolved with an impulse gives you the same thing back. Yeah, x of t convolved with delta gives you x of t. And it works the same way when you have Discrete system, x of n convolved with delta of n gives you back x of n. Again, you can say the same thing. Convolution sum, this unit impulse is going to be valid when n equals m. Evaluate this guy at n equals m, you have x of n. So how can you think about this uh, in a system view? If your input is x of t, and if your impulse response is delta of t, here, you see that? That's interesting, right? Impulse response is impulse. 
What is the output? XRT. All right, questions here? Once, twice. Time reversal. What happens to convolution when you have a time reversal? So let's see. If you are given that C of T is the result of convolving two signals, A and B, then if you reverse A and you reverse B and convolve them, it will result in reversing the end result, C. So if you flip A and you flip B and you convolve these guys, the result is going to be what happened when you flipped C, time reversal of C. Same applies for discrete. If you are given that C of N is the result of discrete convolution between sequences A and B, if you have a time reversal on both A and B, and you're convolving them after the time reverse, then your answer is going to be C, which is time reversed. It happens for both signals B. We can't say that, but we, can, we don't have a property for that. We don't have like a C of N equals this for that. Uh, anyone else hear a bit of echo? Uh, All right, I, it looks like it got resolved. All right, let's move on. So that's your time reversal. Next, commutative property. A boring proof follows. So usually when I say it's a boring stuff, then people pay more attention. That's usually how it's supposed to go. Let's see. <laughs> so commutative property, what does it say? If I convolve X with H, it's going to be the result in the same thing as H with X. Order of convolution doesn't matter, right? Order in which you are doing the convolution doesn't matter. And the same thing applies even for the discrete time. X convolved with H is gonna be the same thing as H convolved with X. Order of convolution doesn't matter. In, a, in order to prove this commutative property, we are going to look at a proof which is discrete time based. So what I have over here is, y of n is defined as the convolution of x and h. These are discrete signals. And using the convolution sum, I can write this as summation m equals negative infinity to infinity, x of m, h of n minus m. Quick question. This convolution sum is written based on what properties? Which specific properties have we leveraged to be able to write this convolution sum? Good. Linearity and time invariance, yes. Linearity includes homogeneity and additivity and time invariance. So we used linearity and time invariance to be able to write that. If we didn't have those properties supporting the system, we wouldn't be able to write that. Uh, next, I'm defining Z as a new convolution in which I'm reversing the, uh, the, the signals here, H with X. So I'm going to also adjust my summation here, right? Summation of M equals negative infinity to infinity, H of M, X of N minus M. Now our goal is going to be to show what? Y equals X. If I'm able to show Y equals X, then I know that order of upper, uh, our order of convolving signals doesn't matter. Now observe that y of n, if I, uh, if I write this as summation, uh, the convolution sum, m going from negative infinity to infinity, x of m, h of n minus m. Now in order for me to get close to this, I may need a change of variable, right? Because I have an n minus m there, I want to manipulate it to get an m there, right? So I'm going to go for a change of variable. So the change of variable that I'm applying over here is, let us assume that k equals n minus m so that I get one variable over there. If I make 
k equals n minus m, then I get m as n minus k. I'm going to have to reevaluate the summation limit. m was going from negative infinity to infinity. So now k is going to go from infinity to negative infinity. But it's a summation, so it doesn't matter anyway. OK, so if I bring this over here, what is going to happen? All of this is going to change to x of m is going to change to x of n minus k. You see this? n minus m, n minus m has to be k. So here, n minus m has to be k. n minus k has to be m. So m is what we are writing over here. So instead of m, I'm writing n minus k because of this. And then I have got h of k. I've also adjusted the limits. k equals infinity to negative infinity. But that doesn't matter. You add things this way or you add things this way. So you can, you can flip them around. k is going from negative infinity to infinity. Multiplication is commutative. So I can bring this up up front. h of k, x of n minus k. What is that? It's the same thing as this, right? Except that we have k instead of m. So convolution is commutative. Order of convolution doesn't matter. Questions here? <laughs> here, the, so believing me is one thing, but you know, it will help you guys with numerical problems. The more you see change of variable and adjusting the limits, the, the, the better it's going to be when you actually face a newer, newer problem to prove or to, oh, is this linear or not? Then you are faced with a newer problem, right? <laughs> All right. Commutative property. We'll continue our discussion with cascade connections. What do we have here? We have two situations in which there are two cascades. X is your input. It is going into a linear time invariant system with an impulse response H1. The output of that is going into another linear and time invariant system H2, which is giving us the output. Why do you change of the variable? Yeah, all right. So the reason why I change the variable is this. You see, over here, I had H of n minus m. I wanted to prove that it is the same as this. Over here, h of m, one variable here, two things over here. So if I want to make this proof to equal this, then I need something like this. n minus m is k, so that I get k over here. And I will be able to go from here to here. That's the reason of the change of the variable. All right, let's move on. Right, so uh, the cascades, right? And the, and the, the claim over here is, because the order of convolution doesn't matter for two signals, x and h, then it shouldn't matter for three or four or 10, right? So x convolved with h1 convolved with h2 should be the same as x convolved with h2 convolved with h1, right? What is going to be the result over here? Well, take x, convolved with h1, and you get that, right? And then you convolve that guy with x convolved with h1, convolved with h2, you get that, right? Input, impulse response, output, obtained by convolution. So the, the claim over here is it's going to be the same thing as this, uh, because of that order, it doesn't matter. x convolved with h2, and over here is going to equal x convolved with h2 first, then with h1. Now, what is going to be the impulse response of both cases? So if you look at x all the way on the left, y all the way on the right, this is your cascaded system, both systems together. What is the impulse response of both systems together? Anyone? Uh, H1, what with H2? H1 convolved with H2 will give you the impulse response of this guy. 
Because remember, you see this? This is what? X convolved with H1 convolved with H2, right? So if this is my impulse response, then I can say X convolved with the impulse response gave me Y, right? So this is my impulse response of both these systems. So if you want both the, the impulse response of both systems in cascade, then you need to convolve the impulse responses of each of them. And it is also going to be the same as this, right? H2 convolved with H1. This is a very likely scenario one week from today. Very likely scenario that you will be in. What is that? I want to find the output of the system. I'm given X, H1, H2. Should I convolve X with H2 first, then with H? Or is it mathematically going to be convenient if I do X with H first, then with H2? Right? So that choice of, now you have the order choice. And you are going to have to do it with by hand, on paper, mathematically. So one way will be a lot easier than the other. What do you like? No matter how complex one thing gets, so you see, it's going to be in three steps, right? X with H with H, right? So that the, the convolution is being performed twice. What does that mean? That means that when I, when, it, when I get done with the first time, I will have to do it another time after that. So the result after you do it the first time might be very complex, right? After you do it the first time, the answer of that convolution might be very difficult to handle. It might be very complicated. complicated. So what do you prefer for the second H to be convolved? Like for the second convolution, what would you ideally want it to be with? Impulse, right? Because convolution with an impulse doesn't do anything. It's just X, H, X, delta X. Even if there was time shift involved, you could take care of that easily. So you would have to take that into account, right? So let me try to convert two things that are not the impulses first, so that at the end, I can bring in the impulse and do that last step very easily. You guys see that? Now, can, is this, is this uh, what would be a reasonable, where do you think you will see the impulse? Will you see an impulse over here? Practically speaking, will you see an impulse here, or will you see an impulse here, or will you see an impulse here? Most likely with X, with the input itself, right? I don't know many systems whose impulse response is the same as impulse. But X is an input. I'm clapping every, I'm generating an impulse, right? So what that means is, it would have been better off for me to go for the third choice. Convolve X with H first, then bring in the impulse at the end, right? Earlier I was telling you this with this, and then with this. Then I said, oh, it might be better than this with this, and then with this. There's another way. H1 and H2 first, then bring in the input at the end. Order doesn't matter. So I hope you guys see the, the content and see where you could have this situation um, uh, like something where you, you are actually in this situation where you have to use this skill. Questions? No questions. All right, let's move on. Time shift. How are we going to handle time shifts? One thing is given, other things will follow. What is given? Given is... The signal C is the result of convolving A and B. These are two continuous time signals. And if we convolve them, we get the answer C. And let us say that we have two scalars, T1 and T2. T1 and T2 belong to the set of real numbers. And if we shift A by T1, and if we shift B by T2, then the convolution of A shifted by T1 with B shifted by T2 is going to be the same as A shifted by T2 
and b shifted by t1 and the result is going to be simply c shifted by the sum of t1 and t2. Can you see that? Sum of the time shifts. That's it. That's the property. Again, you can prove this using, what, what would you use to prove this? Either in this continuous time world or in the discrete time world, what would you use to prove this? If the question was, prove this, to prove the time shifting property of convolution, what would you use? Convolution integral. Yeah? You would actually use the convolution integral and or the convolution sum and go through this proof. Again, the same thing as before, right? You would, you would have define a new signal z and then you would try to see if, and there's gonna be a lot of time, a change of variable things that you will have to play out. But your source, the primary thing that you are gonna use is the convolution integral for continuous time or the convolution sum for discrete time. Questions? Again, this should be like two times two now. What is X convolved with impulse? X convolved with delta at T minus T zero. So impulse is shifted. X of T minus T zero. All right. Uh, what is the last one? X of di discrete. Excellent. Symmetry properties. Now, when signals are even, have even symmetry or odd symmetry, you can comment about the symmetry of the result of their convolution. So for the first symmetry property that we have here is an even signal convolved with an even signal results in an even signal. That's the claim. Let's try to play it out in terms of a proof. Well, not a complete proof, but with some examples. A of t is a rectangle, b of t is a rectangle. They are both even, right? They are, they are symmetric about the y-axis. They are both even. So the answer should be even. That's what I know right now. Now, I want you guys to think about convolving these two rectangles without the use of any steps. In other words, are you guys at a place with convolution that you will be able to write the result of this convolution directly? In order to help you see that, I'm going to ask a few questions. One, where does the output start? St start and stop of your y of t, or in this case, you're calling it, uh, well, the convolution. Where does the convolution result start and stop? Go ahead. The convolution. So after you convolve these two signals, the result is going to be starting at some time and ending at some time. So negative seven, it will start at negative seven and end at seven, yeah? All right, so I know that. It starts at negative seven, ends at seven, yeah? All right, next. Is it going to be a triangle shape or a trapezoid shape? Okay. Trapezoid, why is that? One is smaller than the other, right? So two different width rectangles. Sub question, if they had the same width, but different height, would it be a trapezoid or would it be a triangle? Would That would be a triangle. So the requirement for that trapezoid is that in terms of their width, they have to be different, right? Okay. It has to be a trapezoid, good. So trapezoid has what? Now you know the trapezoid, trapezoid is going to start at negative seven and end at seven, right? So it's gonna go up, flat, down, okay? What do we need to find? How long is it going to go up? We need to answer that. What is the height? We need to answer that. And then for how long is it going to come down? We need to answer that. So if it starts at negative seven, how long is it going to keep increasing? Uh, for how many time units? Six time units. Why is that? The, the smaller triangle, uh, the smaller rectangle is six time units, right? 
So it's going to take six time units for it to completely grow from absolutely outside to absolutely inside. Right? Six time units is going to increase. Yeah. Okay. After it increases to six time units, how long is it going to stay there as trapezoid? Two time units. Why is that? Between the difference between the two widths, right? One is six, one is eight, the difference is two. So for two time units, it's going to stay there at the top. What happens after that? Six time units, it is it'll decrease. Yeah? Six time units will go down. Agreed? Everybody seeing that now? Now the only thing that we need to find out is what? The height of the trapezoid. Multiply the two signals, multiply, uh, uh, sorry, multiply the two signals when they are completely inside one another and integrate over the overlapping time. What would be the overlapping time? The smaller rectangle, right? Two times two times six, what is that? Two times two, four, four times six, 24. You got it? Starts at negative seven, goes up for six time units, stays there for two, comes down for six time units, height is 24. Yeah? So when you are seeing rectangles and convolution, you, are, you should be feeling very happy. This I can do without any problem, right? Questions about this? Any uh, very like easy now? Yeah. Now, if that is C of T, well, first of all, is it even? It is symmetric about the y-axis, so we have kind of validated that statement already, right? Next, for later reference, I will also need the derivative of C of T. So how can I find the derivative of C of T? All right, below negative seven and above positive seven is gonna be zero anyway, right? There's nothing there. So you don't need to have any different derivative there. Uh, what is the slope between negative seven and one? Between negative seven and plus one, what is the slope? Plus four, right? dy by dx. All right, so between this guy and this guy, it is going to be uh, plus four. All right, between negative one and zero, uh, negative one and one, sorry, zero. All right, between one and seven, negative four. You guys okay with that? All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to lead, need this later, so I'm, I just have it for reference now. Let's move on. The next symmetry property that we are going to look at is what happens when you convolve odd with even? So th there's a question, like we need to answer that. Are you going to get odd or even, right? So in order to prove that, or in order to find the answer to that, I'm gonna take an example and look at it. I have two impulses that I need to convolve uh, with a rectangle. What do I get? Look at this. What, do I, what did I, how did I get my first signal? I literally found the derivative of A of T. I literally took this guy, find the derivative of that, discontinuity up, discontinuity down, both of them, they were jumping up or down by two units, right? At negative three and at three. Weight is two at negative three. Weight is negative two at positive three, yeah? So that's how I got A of T, an odd signal, right? It's an odd signal, symmetric about origin. And I'm trying to leave B of T as is, my even function as is. What would be a really good way of handling this? Handle one convolution at a time. Do this with this, then do this with this. So when you do this impulse with this guy, what is going to happen? Well, 
2 times 2, the height is going to be 4, you are going to get this same rectangle, but it is now going to be centered at negative 3, right? Time shift with an impulse, the whole thing shifts over there, right? So, centered at negative 3, height of 4, a rectangle, of width, 8, yeah? That's how you get this piece. Centered at negative 3, width of 8, height of 4. And if you do that same thing with this, negative 2 times 2, negative 4, start, uh, center is at 3, width is 8, because of this guy. Yeah? I, now I just need to add them up. When I add them up, this piece is going to cancel out. What do you get? You get that? Well, two things to note. One, is it even or odd? Odd. So let me just answer this here. Second thing is this. Did you see this before? Yes. Right here. When you, what, what does that mean? That means that if I differentiated one of those signals, my answer also got differentiated. When I was convolving them, I differentiated A, right? I differentiated A, and because of that, C, the answer of that also got differentiated. So this sort of hints at what property? Which property are we talking about right now? Derivative property. All right, let's come back. All right, so that's it. Uh, we did even time, even convolved with even, and then we did odd convolved with even, and I think we should again talk about even convolved with odd, right? No, we shouldn't. Why, why, why not? Commutative, exactly. So we don't need to do that. We know even convolved with odd is also going to be odd. So the only thing that is left, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. So you wouldn't do derivative of both. You would do derivative of one convolved with the other. Let me get to the property, and then we'll talk more about that, uh, because I have a nice example to, to, do, to do over there. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's how I would deal with that. Um, it might take longer, depending on how it, easy it is to handle the ramps without derivative. So you would have to sort of assess that on the go. Right, so if you had ramp with rectangle, is it useful to do the derivative or not? That's a question that you have to answer. I'm really, I know the answer of rectangle with rectangle, so I'll do the derivative. Might not apply for all of them. It applies to me because I like the rectangles, but it's not, it's not applicable for everyone. Some people really like to do that integration because they're very good with the, the limits and they enjoy doing the case by case basis. It, it sort of depends on the individual. Uh, let's take a look at your third symmetry property, which is odd with odd. Odd signal convolved with odd signal gives you even signal. And this one will prove. And like I said, the proof will be based on the convolution integral or the convolution term if it were to be discrete. So we are going to let our signals that we are convolving be odd. How do we say they are odd? Well, a of t has to equal negative a of minus t, b of t has to equal negative b of minus t, right? That's how we know that they are odd. There is a equal, uh, sorry, there's a reversal both in the y and the x direction. That's why they end up being symmetric about the origin. Next, we are going to need to show that a convolved with b, which gives us c, is going to be even. What does that mean? c of t should equal c of minus t. So if you are able to say, if you are able to find out, prove that c of t is equal to c of minus t, we should be okay. Let's start with c equals a convolved with b. And because we are in continuous time, we write the continuous, uh, the convolution integral, negative infinity to infinity, a of tau, b of t minus tau, d tau. Next, if that is c of t, what is c of minus t? We are gonna have to do like a flip on the time, right? So negative infinity to infinity for the integration, we got a of tau 
there's no t there, so I don't need to flip there. But because there is a t there, I'm going to need to replace that with b of minus t. Then we have got the minus tau from before, and then we have got d tau from before, right? So everything changed. Instead of t's, now we have negative t's. Question here. This t changed to negative t. So this t should change to negative t. That's it. That's the only change. Now, a of tau is equal to a of negative tau. Why can I say that? Because of this being odd. b of negative t minus tau is going to equal negative b of t plus tau. Why can I say that? Because of this being odd. Now, once you do that, this minus gets cancelled with that minus. You are left with integration negative infinity to infinity, a of minus tau, b of t plus tau, d tau. Now, you can actually say that this is this going to be the same thing as c of t right away because you have minus tau there and then plus tau there. However, if you wanted to you know, go one more step to prove that, you can say let lambda equals negative tau so that what? You get a lambda there and then you get a minus lambda there. c of minus tau is going to equal infinity to negative infinity. Why is that? Tau is negative lambda. So when you changed d tau, well, d tau is going to be now negative d lambda. The lower limit is going to change to plus infinity. The upper limit is going to change to negative infinity. You have a of lambda, b of t minus lambda, d of negative lambda, which is negative d lambda. Uh, now, that's it, right? This is a of tau, b of t minus tau, d tau. You see, uh, what did we change here? That, that's it. And that, that's your c of t. So use the properties of odd for A and B, and then evaluated the even part of C, and then proved that it is equal to C of T. Started with the convolution integral. We needed to do a change of variable once, use the property of odd twice, here and here. Questions? Any part of this proof that is troubling? Which part of this proof is tricky? Which one? Bunch of minus signs? Yeah, yeah. For lower and upper bounds. Uh, well, I think the signs are switched for second to last integral. Oh, no. So here, d of negative lambda, right? So d of negative lambda is going to be negative. That takes care of the switching of the bound for the integration. So a bunch of negative signs is going to be, that's what is going to create table. All right, so we have got odd and odd. Ooh, nice. Let's do this. We like convolving things with impulses. So now we have signals that are impulses on both sides. Both the signals are impulses. How do you deal with this? Oh, by the way, this is odd, this is odd, so the answer is going to be even. So let's hope that we get an even answer for the, for the output. How do you deal with this problem? So one way to do it would be this guy with this first, then this second. And then this guy with this first and this second, right? So deal with them individually. Uh, what I'll do is this. I'll start with, say, I'm using red here, right? So I'll use maybe green. Uh, so I'll do this guy with this guy first. What am I going to get with those two impulses? Where is it going to be, and what is it? Uh, what is the weight going to be? Delta with a delta is what? Delta, right? X with delta is X, so delta with delta should also be delta, right? Okay, so delta with delta is a delta. All right, so if you look at the two um, impulses that are pointing down, 
when you convolve them, where is the impulse going to be? What is its weight going to be? The location? Negative two, well, the, the time bound in lower bound plus lower bound equals lower bound on the answer. Upper bound plus upper bound equals upper bound on the answer. Right? Bounds you increase, add up. So you've got negative one here, negative one here, so the answer is going to be at negative two. Right? So at negative two, you will get an impulse that is one. Negative one times negative one, you get negative uh, positive one at negative two. Ah. You guys okay with that for those two? Good. Okay. So this is uh, where did we talk about this last? Where did we talk about this last? Was that? Uh, well, time shifting uh, is after you get it, right? Like, why do the bounds add? It, we talked about it in terms of discrete convolution first, and then we extended it to continuous convolution. So we talked about it first when we are looking at elements of, so here is the example. Uh, not this, where is signals? Give me one second. This is summer 21, right? Okay. Uh, let's see, five, B should be it, right. Right, there it is. So when we went through this discrete convolution, like step by step, we looked at the answer, has a lower limit of zero and an upper limit of eight because of these two being zero and then be these two being seven, right? So the last non-zero value is at seven. So it starts at zero, ends at seven because of those two values. And that essentially corresponds to when do you get your first sum and so on, right? Like when do you get your first sum with this? When does that overlap first? It's overlapping when the highest value here meets with this value here, right? So that would be the sum of the lower limits. And then you can apply that for even the upper limits. So that's where we started talking about this and we extended that to um, continuous time. So that's, that's why. But you know, if, if you wanted to prove this, you could prove this using the, 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 the convolution integral or convolution sum. With convolution sum we did, but you could prove this as well. Next. These two guys, let's use purple. What is that, that going to result in? Time is two and height is one. Is that okay? Now, the confusing bit. This with that and that with this. Location and weight. Wait. Yes, so they're gonna be this plus that. They're gonna add up. So after they get add up, after they add up, where is that answer going to be and what is the weight? Origin, right. So at zero, you get negative. Uh, let me use red for this. Is it odd or even? Right? Odd odd, even, consistent with this guy. Now, is the, if, if the graphs are making you a little bit, uh, can, can, if they're confusing you, then here is an alternate. Write it 
too big. Negative delta of t plus one plus delta of t minus one convert with negative delta of t plus one and, uh, plus delta of t minus one. Right? Then you can start seeing this convolve with this, this convolve with this, this convolve with that, this convolve with that, like a foil, right? You can literally do a foil, but now on convolutions. And then you will get what? Answer will be four terms. Two of them you can combine. You'll get this guy, this guy, and this guy. Questions about this example? Getting more and more comfortable with uh, Convolving things with impulses, yeah? All right, here is the derivative property. Uh, Bennett was curious about that. Now, A convolved with B, the derivative of that, the derivative of the result of convolving A and B is the same as A convolved with the derivative of B or derivative of A convolved with B. We have kind of looked at that already play out in the symmetry properties A and B. And we looked at it with respect to derivative of A. And you can also do that with deriv de derivative of B. Uh, what you don't see over here is derivative of A and derivative of B. Right? You are not doing derivative of A and B. You're just doing a derivative of one of them. Where could this be useful? I like rectangles and rectangles. So I'll convolve them, find out the result, and then work backwards. Right? So if I, if B of T happens to be a ramp, if I differentiate that, I get a rectangle. I really like convolving things with rectangles. I get a trapezoid or a triangle. So if I reverse the integration, I will know what C of T is. You guys see that? Uh, okay, so where, how low can you go? So you said, if I have ramps, I can go to rectangles, right? What if you have rectangles? You can go to impulses. Because when you differentiate rectangles, you go to impulses. But that's your limit. You can't differentiate impulses. That's where you will stop. This uh, property of derivating uh, signals is a little bit useful now. But when we get to Fourier transform and Laplace transform, the derivative property is make or break. Uh, so. I have seen signals like a cubic function, and then people will be like, oh my gosh, how do I find the, how, how do I do any sort of math with this cubic function? No need to worry. Differentiate it once, you get quadratic. Second time, third time, go down to as far as constants or impulses even, and then you work your big way back. You'll have to integrate on the, on the way back. Go ahead. So it, what would you have to do for that? You would have to do a d squared, right? So the answer also gets the uh, second derivative. Yeah, that, that's all. Next, we have distributive property. And here is an example, which is uh, an example that I really like. So we are going to try to convolve this guy with this guy. And we should be able to do it without any math. Meaning, if I fix one and take the other, flip it and move it across the first one, I should be able to know the end of the result without actually having to do any kind of math. But we'll do some math as well to make that connection. But I'm telling you that as, an, as you're getting comfortable, you guys should be able to make that jump. All right, let's, let's take a look at that distributive property. What is it? A convolved with the sum of B and T, uh, B and C is the same as A convolved with B plus A convolved with C. You can distribute A, you can do distribution of the convolution operation, right? A convolved with B plus C is the same as A convolved with B plus A convolved with C. Something like multiplication in algebra. You can, you can do distribution there, you can distribute distribution here. 
And the same applies for discrete signals. Let's try to do this example. And while we are doing this example, we'll use some of the properties that we have seen. You have A, which is simply your G of T, right? Like that's your gate function. Open the gate at zero, close the gate at one. And then you have B, which is sort of a staircase uh, signal. My first goal is going to be to write B of T in terms of A of T. Need help. B of T, write B of T in terms of A of T. I think you guys can do this. Yeah. You guys agree with that? Yeah? Next. Let us say that C, con C of T is actually what is that is, A of T converged with B of T, right? That's what we are trying to find out, C. We already wrote B in terms of A. So what do we have? A of T convolved with B of T written in terms of A of T. Yeah? Next. Distributive property. A of T convolved with A of T plus 2. A of t convolved with A of t minus 1 plus uh, A of t convolved with A of t minus 2. You guys okay with that? Distributive property. Now, in order for me to find these three pieces, what do I need to evaluate? There's only one thing I need to really evaluate here. What is that? That's it, right? So if I convolve these two guys, that's it. That's all I need. Because this is going to be that result shifted, that result shifted by two, right? So all I need is this. So let me say, uh, let me define this as M of T. Yeah? So what does this become? What does this become then? Done. So can you guys tell me what M of T is going to be? M of T is A with A. Triangle, trapezoid, starts where, ends where, what is the height? Shape? Triangle. For M of T, shape is triangle. Add after... Current, uh, squared paper, where is squared paper? All right, fine. Uh, what is that you guys said? M of T. Uh, triangle, okay. Where does it start, where does it stop? Starts at zero. Stop at two. Height is? Think about the height. One times one for one, for one, right? Zero to one to two, yeah? Is that okay? What did I want? I wanted this, right? M of t plus 2 m of t minus 1 plus m of t minus 2. How is that going to look like? Well, let me put those pieces here. I'm going to have 
one piece here, another piece over here, and a third piece over here. Yeah. Not to scale, but you guys, I hope you can see. This is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this crooked line is going to be 1, and this is going to be 2. When you add up these three pieces, what do you get? All right, here, the way to deal with this. Here is the confusion, right? One guy is going down with a slope of one. One guy is going up with a slope of one. What is going to happen between one and two? That is going to be simply keep going up, right? One guy is going down by slope of two, actually. Sorry, uh, this guy is going up by two. This guy is going down by one. So effectively, you are going up by one, right? Sorry, I, I, I said cancel out. It doesn't cancel out going down by slope of one, this guy is actually going up by a slope of two. So it's going up by one. What is going to be the peak? Two here, zero here, so two is going to be the peak, right? How did you get the triangles? Uh, so this is M of T, right? If this is M of T, I said C of T, equals m of t plus 2 m of t minus 1 plus a of uh, m of t minus 2. So this guy is this, this guy is this, this guy is that. But how is m of t a triangle? Oh, so m of t is a of t convert with A of t, right? So rectangle convolved with rectangle. So starts at zero, ends at two. They are the same rectangle. So it's going to go in, increase, then overlap. You get the peak and then leave, go down. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so I need to add them up. I'm gonna get, get something like this. That's it. C of T and T. Questions? Using distributive property and the time shifts property, we have we have done that. The only thing that we need evaluated is A with A, and then we, we were able to use superposition to write out everything. Question. No questions? Did you guys start working on homework six? Yeah? Did you guys like the second or the third problem? Let me check which problem was it. What? Oh, unanswered questions. Uh, what was it? Homework six. All right. Not the second problem. Sorry, the third problem. The third problem. Did you? Did you, any anybody attempt that? It looks like what? It's an even signal convolved with an odd function. So we know the answer should be doing something odd, right? So if you are not getting an odd signal, then you know it's a problem. If you are able to handle the math that is support going to support problem three, uh, then you are 
going to be doing really, really well in this class. The, the, the math uh, will rarely go more difficult than the math you would need for problem three. Provided you would do it with hand, like there, there, there are ways to do it using Wolfram Alpha and all those things. But if you are do, able to handle it by hand, it's a good problem. It's a really, really good problem to solve. So focus on, was that? You can do, you can do that way. But the way I, re, so because I, because I assigned this as part of the last week homework and not this, I actually solved it entire thing, um, the whole signal. I don't piece it out and use distributive. Was that? Yeah, I use the graphical approach without using the, the, the distributive property. But you could do it. Like if it was, this was on an, this is not a good example to have on an exam. Uh, but if this was on an exam, you could, you could do it using a distributive property. The, the quadratic spoils the exam. Yeah, if this was, yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is a way for me to ask this question on the exam without um, without actually needing you to act, deal with the quadratic. Uh, let's see, go back. Oh, distributive property in terms of a parallel connection. So when you see system impulse responses, one was cascade, right? This after the other. That was what, using the commutative property, we, we could say, I can switch these two around. But over here, we are saying X convolved with H1 plus H2. H1 plus H2 is what? The impulse response of the parallel connection. What do you get over here? You get X convolved with H1 over here, and then you get X convolved with H2 over here. The two outputs of the system are getting summed, and you get Y, which is what? X convolved with H1 plus X convolved with H2, which is X convolved with H1 plus H2. So this becomes your system impulse response, H. So when you have things in parallel, the impulse response of the overall system is getting added up. When you have things in cascade one after the other, they are getting convolved with each other. Properties of LTI systems. So we have uh, 10 minutes left. Let's try to get into this. We talked about memory. We talked about causality. We talked about stability. These three aspects of systems. We looked at all those in the context of input-output relationship. Right? How does, what happens to Y when I give you X? What does output depend on when I talk, talk about the input? Is it present? Is it future? Which one, right? So one way to talk about properties of LTI systems is by talking about their input-output relationship. I'll tell you what Y is if, I give, if, you, if you give me X. What is the other way? Input-output relationship describes an LTI system. Impulse response also describes the system. Which means that I should be able to talk about memory, no memory, stability, unstable, uh, causality, non-causal, in terms of, by looking at the impulse response of the system. I don't need the input-output relationship. Let's see that? So that's what we are going to do here. We're going to talk about the same properties, but with the view of impulse response. One is memory. Does the system have memory or not? You remember that, how did we, oh, not blue, I don't want blue. Uh, how did we define memoryless systems in lecture five? We said the output at any given time has to depend on input at that same time. That's how we defined it. How, what does that ta translate to in terms of impulse response? It translates to this. An LTI system is said to be memoryless if and only if its impulse response is some scaled version of an impulse. Impulse response is some C, some constant, some scalar times delta of N or delta of T. 
If that is the case, then it is memoryless, which means that the impulse response only has to be defined at time zero. That's it. No less than, no earlier, no later. We can prove that pretty easily using the this convolution sum. What is the convolution sum? Y, e, y of n equals summation m equals negative infinity to infinity x of m, h of n minus m. That's your convolution sum. Using commutative property, you can switch the signals. You got negative infinity to infinity, h of m, x of n minus m. So that's the statement. Convolution is commutative. We proved it. So we are, we are doing that first. Next, if this is the summation, m is going from negative infinity to infinity, we can break it up into three pieces. m is negative, m is zero, m is positive. So we've got the same summation when m is negative here, m is zero here, and m is one and greater than one integer here, right? Three pieces. Now, if you look at this piece, what does this need? It needs x of n minus m. Well, m is negative, so x of n minus m is going to be future input, right? n minus 2. Well, n minus minus 2 will become n plus 2. So that's a future input. So my output cannot depend on future input, right? That's what we established in memoryless system. It has to depend on right now. So because of the presence of future inputs and because of the presence of past inputs over here, these two things cannot affect my output in order for me to call it memoryless. So these two go out. The only thing that left is left is this, h of zero, x of zero. So you see this output is the product of x of zero and uh, h of zero and x of zero. What is that? Impulse response evaluated at time zero multiplied by x of zero, which means it is a scaled, scaled impulse. That's it, because that's the only time it is available, uh, valid. For any LTI system to be memory less, impulse response h of n has to be zero for n not equals to zero. It can be some c, some value c, but it has to be only at n equals to zero. So you have taken the previous conversation about how y relates to x, right? How, what does y depend on? Only on the present, or only on the current inputs. That's it. No future, no past. And we have looked at the same thing, but with a view of impulse response. Is this system memoryless? No. Right? It can only be defined here, either positive or negative, but it has to only be at zero, right? So this would be a memoryless system if this was h of t. One impulse pointing down with a weight of negative two, for example. That would be a memoryless system. Questions about this? Wrote the convolution sum, broke it into three pieces looked at the piece that is dependent on future inputs and past inputs, these cannot play a role because that's how we defined memoryless systems in lecture five. Y of n can only depend on X of n. So we remove those two, we are left with H of zero and X of zero. X of zero can be the weight, H of zero is impulse response valid only at that time zero. Next, uh, how about causality? For causality, LTI systems is causal if impulse response is zero for time less than zero. Impulse response is zero, uh, uh, for, is zero for time less than zero for continuous time. So if you look at this, is this causal? Yes, so it is zero over here. You look at the impulse response and if it is zero for time less than zero, you know it is going to be uh, causal. Very easily you can prove this. Why is that? You see this? Again, you can break it up into three summations like this. But over here, you will have this. You will have this, but you will get rid of this, right? All of these guys will go away. 
That's causality. No dependence on future inputs. That's how we define causality. Uh, let's see. We'll do it over here. Either. Output signals depends on present and past. No dependence on future inputs. What is that? That is the definition of causal system as we did in lecture 5. Using input-output relationship. Output at any given time can depend on input right now or before right now. Past. Cannot depend on future. Now using that, again, we are breaking the convolution sum into two pieces now. One is future, one is present or past. Only two pieces. Future, present or past we have combined. Cannot depend on future, so this goes out. Only depends on this and this, which means what? M has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? So H of M, the impulse response can be non-zero only for values that are greater than or equal to M, zero. So that gives us this statement. LTI system to be causal, impulse response is going to be zero for n less than zero. It has to be zero for time less than zero. Very easy, right? Sketch the impulse response, and if it is zero for negative times, it's causal. If it is zero for neg negative as well as positive time, it is memory less. You guys are looking like you are looking for 12.05 to hit. Uh, let's see. All right, we'll, we'll wrap it up in the next class. Okay, so we have a few things to talk about. Uh, just about, you know, system properties uh, when we come back on, today's Monday? Yeah, Thursday. So that will also be part of exam, but it's not, it's not too difficult. Stability, I'm talking about inverse, uh, and we'll, we'll see how can we uh, solve a differential equation, which you guys should be experts at by now. Um, and after that, we get into Fourier series. Have you guys heard about Fourier series? Yes? When you guys think about Fourier series, uh, do, you, do you get scared? Yeah, me too. <laughs> but does it fascinate you? Here, so I'll leave you guys with this idea, right? Fourier series is a way to represent periodic signals using sinusoids. As simple as that. I can represent, here is a statement. I can represent any periodic signal using sinusoids. Can you guys think about any periodic signal? Can you give me a bunch of some standard periodic signals? Triangular wave, square wave, <laughs> arbitrary custom periodic wave? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so that's, that's the, that's sort of the, Sawtooth. See, all of these signals are periodic signals, right? So now think about this. When I learned Fourier series, I got fascinated about the idea for one reason. What was that? I'm taking sinusoid, right? A sinusoid continuously changes, right? Up, down, up, down. is changing. How can I take a sinusoid and make it into a square wave? How can I do that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. But here, that was the fascination, right? So for me, it was, it was interesting because I'm taking something that changes with time all the time, and I'm producing something that is constant with time, right? So how can you do that? So that was the reason why I got attracted to it, and everybody is sort of really good at it already, and you guys are giving away the answer, which is uh, you have, you'll have to add up a bunch of sinusoids. Some sinusoids are going to be low frequency, high amplitude, and as you increase the frequency, you are going to make them smaller and smaller and smaller so that you tend towards a square, but you actually don't get a square. And you see that on an oscilloscope. You go ripple and go down, ripple and settle. Yeah? So Fourier series, what does it answer? It answers what frequencies will I need and what is the amplitude of those frequencies that I need to make up that square wave. Was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the, same, it's the same idea, right? Like which frequencies and what is the strength of each frequency?
There you go. Yeah. So a squared signal broken up into multiple sinusoids. It's all sort of tying to the same, but it's as simple as that. One signal broken up into all its pieces. Each piece has a certain magnitude and frequency. That's absolutely it. So next time when we meet, I will be using my phone to generate a square wave. And then I'll show you guys in real time how the spectrum of a square wave looks like. Demo first, math later, so that you can, you can see the connection. Okay, that's enough of, can I ask some questions about the homework? Sure, I'm going to stop recording here, and then I'll take your questions, Alan.